Pulp kind of got a bad rep because it used to have very lurid covers back in the 30s. Uh, and it got kind of a bad rep. Now, the magazines, digest-sized magazines on wood pulp are still out there. The Probably the, the best short story markets are, are technically fall into pulp, but they're now producing really high literary quality stuff. But it's still a small digest-sized magazine, uh, analog, magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and Asimov's magazine are all examples of what are technically, you know, monthly pulp fiction entities. Um, the, what distinguishes them really, they become, they sort of, uh, science, science, science fiction sort of grew out of the pulps. Uh, there are some critics, Gary Westfall among them, who argue that uh, the beginning of science fiction was in the publication of the very first specialized science fiction magazine. It was called Amazing Stories. It was pu first published in 1926 by Hugo Gernsback. Um, and you can get you can dice that a lot of different ways. Other people would say, "Oh no, no, um, you have science fictional elements in uh, stories like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, published in 1819. Uh, you have it in Margaret Cavendish's story, The Blazing World, published in 1666. You have it in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which goes back 5,000 years. There, there's it's weird life extension stuff. I'm not the one who came up and, and said that the Epic of Gilgamesh is a science is a arguably a science fiction story. Robert Silverberg, another science fiction writer, uh, wrote a novel called Gilgamesh the King, where he basically did the Gilgamesh story as science fiction. He said that's that's a science fiction story. Yeah, the hard science fiction is basically uh, taking realistic science, science that we know of today and extrapolating it just a bit, making a kind of a logical jump from what we know today. So for instance, if uh, a spaceship can fly at, let's say, 17,000 miles per hour, well, why not make it 50,000 miles per hour? I mean, or maybe even a bit faster to get a story done the way you'd like to get it done realistically. Uh, also, if, if time travel is basically impossible, or at least we have no indication that we can do it quite yet, uh, why jump there? That would be fantasy. Uh, it would be still science fiction, but it would be a tough sell. Although people love time travel stories. Uh, but in the hard science fiction category, I would say uh, there are certain things you can do with time travel. Uh, you can travel into the future if you uh, fly fast enough, you move fast enough. And so I'll, I, I'll do that. The time dilation thing that I use in, in algorithm, again, uh, for very far travel uh, to a distant uh, star, let's say 10,000 light years away, might take a year or two years or several years if you travel fast enough. And those are realistic possibilities, so, but they, they're not technology we have currently. So that's what I mean by hard science fiction, something that you can imagine is possible. Um, the softer science fiction is a lot of fun too. Uh, you have Star Trek, Star Wars, and all the other uh, wonderful stories. They're a heck of a lot of fun. There's nothing wrong with them at all. Uh, the clever thing to do in any fiction is to sell the reader a, uh, a hook, something that they can believe could happen, even if it's not scientifically feasible. If they can believe it, then you can sell a story that's a heck of a lot of fun, and that's just fine. The first thing that comes to mind is faster than light travel, FTL. Um, Einstein says as you approach the speed of light, time changes for you. If you're going to travel across the galaxy in a spaceship and you're going to be traveling at the speed of light, or theoretically, as sci-fi allows you to do, travel in excess of the speed of light, what happens to the aging process? It's difficult for me to get into a, a deep, philosophical science fiction novel and they're traveling through space and they never address the fact of how they're doing the FTL travel. It, it, it's a question that needs to be known. And then they have stasis medical booths where they put the body in and all of a sudden you're magically healed, but they're using present day technology of syringes sticking into your skin and the scalpel comes out and cuts you on robotic arms. But wait a minute, we've moved to the point where we have an AI running the medical bay. We have all the modern medical technology in order to get this produced, but we're still using metal scalpels inside the medical bay. And so I think if you're going to look at the technology of what you're going to make to be the big picture, you need to make all the little pieces follow it through. But the biggest one for me is 
faster than light travel, that very few will deal with that concept. And I think it's one of the reasons I won't write space operas or space novels is I don't want to have to do the research on the sci-fi. It, it's rather daunting. My first four books were written for Dorchester Publishing and they were science fiction romances and that they took place on other planets. These are primarily romance novels. Still you have the hero-heroine relationship. Uh, they develop their love for each other and there's a happy ending. There's aliens, spaceship travel, uh, some of the standard science fiction tropes that we know, but it's people-based. Even though there are aliens and, and spaceship travel, it's like Star Trek. The stories are about people and their emotions. And then after those, uh, I did uh, one standalone book, and then I did a uh, trilogy for Wild Rose Press. And these are books set on Earth based on Norse mythology. So the heroes come from space. Again, I get my space element in there. But the heroines are descendants of the Norse gods, and they have powers derived from these um, mythic people, but they don't know about it. And they and the heroes have to work together to save Earth from a threat from another dimension. So that's kind of a mixed genre series, but uh, I wanted to do it more Earth-based that people could relate to. So these are all the different elements that you can put into those uh, stories. Well, I think uh, science fiction romance, as it is, is, is uh, a niche market, and it's more popular, I would say, since the advent of ebooks and Kindle, because a lot of books can be published there that publishers might not take a chance on. So there are the dedicated fans. You don't start out outlining a sci-fi novel. You start by outlining a novel or a story. Sci-fi plays into it because it allows you to do things you might not normally be able to do in a regular fictional universe um, that is present day. So you have the luxury of being able to use future science or future sociology or psychology, uh, per se, to help your story along. So it helps the story, but it, you don't start out by outlining a science fiction novel. You start out by outlining a story. I love the world, and I will go ahead and I'll come up with this really cool concept for a world. And this world will be really neat. Um, and I'm so interested in making the world. I'm like making the let's go guide to some futuristic or some alternate whatever. And the actual individual plot, not so much. I feel if you build the world, uh, the characters will then populate it and a plot will kind of show up. Uh, my process is that everything has to make sense. So Aton will bring a beautiful concept to me, a beautiful world, or he might have an idea for where he wants something to go, but it has to sort of pass this test of, does that make sense? Uh, would somebody really spend the time to go to this part of the world, given all the other stuff we've talked about that is now currently going on? And if Aton can't really convince me of it, then even though he might have created something really neat, I'll make an argument for it not being part of our outline. Uh, he'll have to agree, you know, because it is a collaboration, but uh, that's generally the criteria by which I end up, you know, um, putting in the fine points of the story, the, you know, the, the sharper edges of the plot, and, and that's how we operate. If he feels that it's, you know, if he can't defend that universe, or Remember, that part of the universe, then it doesn't end up in the story. The subplot is those little interactions that take place that, in my opinion, and here's where sometimes Don and I disagree, uh, build the world and make it a richer, more contextual place. A subplot really, I think, is um, like, for example, um, even though the main theme of our story is, uh, or the overarching theme is what price freedom, the subplot would be, uh, what does it mean to be human? Um, a subplot, you know, with the artificial intelligence that we have actually achieving sentience, a subplot would be their struggle with their own humanity, even though they're not actually human. A subplot would be, for example, um, what does religion look like in the future uh, in which uh, man supposes himself to be his own technological god. These would be subplots that naturally emerge anyways when you're doing an overarching theme like we did in our series of books, uh, What Price Freedom? Those are the undercurrents of that and they emerge through different characters as we write. Aton will tell huh. you some, sometimes, sometimes so characters just build, show up. If you build a complex enough world, the subplots will show up. Correct. Accuracy, 
uh, facts, uh, accuracy in science, accuracy in just, just anything is very important to me. And I'm constantly looking for, the, for inaccuracies and things. Sometimes it can make it hard to enjoy books and movies because I'm always saying, no, no, that can't be right because that's not how things work. So, but uh, consulting uh, uh, experts in the field that um, a, a field of research so if a if a writer is uh, if they need to know about guns and I don't know a lot about guns but I have lots of guns in this book so that's another thing I had to do I had to I bought a book on just a book on handguns just all kinds of handguns and so I looked in I consulted that book when I was um, placing handguns in in the in, with my characters they they had to First of all, they had to fit the right era. They had to be the right technology. And I had to know how a person aims and points them, shoots them, since I, I don't know that much about it. Uh, another area is uh, airship technology. There, there are airships in this book. So I had to do research on airships, um, the differences between helium and hydrogen and 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 um, I mean, what's a dirigible, what's a zeppelin, all these, these different kinds of things. How fast can they fly? That was another thing I had to, to know because in the book, uh, characters, if they fly on a, a steam-powered airship, is that even possible? Is a steam-powered airship even possible? So you can see the details that, that, uh, that you can get into with research. The, uh, the risk of research is sometimes you can get so into it and it's so much fun that you forget to write the book and you end up just with this reams of research and no book. So there's a time when you have to just stop. Pretty much, I, I, I like where a lot of this is going uh, now. I thought for a long time we were dealing with um, plots that uh, uh, were a little too intrinsic. Um, we're dealing now with more, more of a, uh, in science fiction, especially in science fiction, things like uh, The Expanse and some of these other ones. Uh, it was called Leviathan Wakes, I think was the first, the first novel of that, which was later, later became The Expanse Television Series, um, is that way because they deal with uh, the everyday life. It's not a matter of, uh, oh, gee, this is the future. How keen is this? kind of thing it's you know the way they treat it it's an everyday thing and you as a writer are going oh whoa that's different you know but they don't go off to show that it's different so it's a lot less expository i think and i think that's the trend and i think that's where it's going and i honestly think that's what they need and if you look at the book sales i think that backs me up 